In Auckland today, 45-year-old Gene Tunney, ex-heavyweight world champion, mixes it lightly with Sergeant Pilot Bill Ray of the RNZAF. A bunch of servicemen get a close-up of Tunney throwing some of the punches that made him one of the most scientific boxing machines of all time. One-time buck private in the Marines, later top-line professional boxer, and now Navy commander, Tunney has made sport his work and his hobby. He's well-tuned for his job of keeping the Navy boys in fighting shape. As director of the U.S. Navy's physical training, Tunney highlights New Zealand's national drive for physical education. Always in trim himself, he knows the extra importance of physical training today. I'm delighted to at last have an opportunity to visit New Zealand. I've heard so much about its beauty, its loveliness, the scenery, the hospitality of its people, and I've seen that now all for myself. I've verified even the most glowing reports that I've heard about it. General Alexander said, in all the history of the world, the army that was best fitted was the one that eventually won. So it is with this war. Undoubtedly, the best fit army, that is technically, with armaments and physically fit, will be the army that will win. With Mayor Allen of Auckland, Professor Alan Nevins on the left, American scholar and author, takes his first look at one piece of New Zealand before starting a two-month tour of the Dominion. Former history professor at Cornell and Columbia Universities, twice winner of the Pulitzer Prize, Professor Nevins comes as a special representative of the U.S. Office of War Information. His tour schedules broadcast and lectures on American war aims and problems. In Wellington, the National Film Unit interviews Professor Nevins. We are often asked whether the United States will maintain an isolationist position after this war. To this question, the answer is almost certainly no. A number of evidences point to the conclusion that the United States will play its proper part in world affairs after the conflict is ended. The Senate has just passed by overwhelming vote the Connolly Resolution, and the House by equally overwhelming vote the Fulbright Resolution, and Congress has thereby committed itself to the general principle of American participation in world affairs. And finally, there are the public opinion polls, the Gallup poll the University of Denver poll, and so on. These show that the American people are not only strongly in favor of an international organization after the war, but are willing to make tax sacrifices to support it. They are willing, for example, to continue food rationing for some time in order to feed the starving areas of the globe. They are willing that American boys should remain abroad in some force as a police agency. They are willing to bear higher taxation for some years in order to support a world organization. The American view is that a considerable number of causes of international friction would automatically disappear if a strong world organization would, were set up. Take, for example, the question of vital raw materials, tin, rubber, copper, nickel, manganese, and so on. There have always been have nations and have not nations with resulting collisions. But if a powerful international organization were set up to control the distribution of these vital raw materials, seeing that each nation got its proper share, then that cause of friction would, so the American people hope, be eliminated forever. <laughs> Still they come. More Kiwis unload at a Middle East port to reinforce Freiburg's men, now resting here or back home on furlough. The Kiwis have earned a spell, and it's a good chance to pull the division up to fighting strength again with fresh reserves. Pushing ashore on lighters is a crowded business, but the boys are glad to leave the ship and eager to stretch their legs on this desert they've heard about. First, kits have to be lumped again, and there's queuing up again. But it's worth it to get a good hot cup of tea. Time to gather up and move again. The boys take it easy, finding their shore legs and getting used to sun and sand. But they don't walk far. Trucks are waiting. They pile in and are off on the desert road to camp. A few days later, they're on parade again. General Freiburg's here to look them over. He needs men who are fit and tough, more men like those who fought with him through Tunisia. These are the same men, not veterans yet, but they measure up.
They show their paces in a march past. They're steady, they're keen, and they're confident. They know that Hitler can be beaten, for they're joining men who've proved it. When the time comes to hammer him again, they'll do their share. Thank you.